Hello there, I'm Mauro Ranello, and I'm about to engage in the most important conversation I've had as a professional broadcaster. My journey has been chronicled in the Showtime documentary, Bipolar Rock and Roller, and today we will smash the stigma associated with mental health with the undefeated lineal heavyweight champion and a mental health advocate, Tyson Fury. Tyson, we're not going to talk about X's and O's. We're not going to talk about the high altitude here in Big Bear, California. We're not even really going to touch on the test that you faced December 1st against the undefeated WBC heavyweight champion, Deontay Wilder. We're going to take a moment and a few minutes here to talk about a fight that's the biggest of our lives and the biggest for so many people. That's, that's the battle with mental health issue. And you have been very vocal about your struggles with mental health. And I want to thank you for being vocal because you smashed the stigma just by standing 6'9", 255 pounds, being one of the baddest men on the planet and yet you decided to be public with your mental health issues. Why? I just wanted to show the world that if mental health could bring somebody as big as me and as strong as me and, you know, the stereotype heavyweight champion of the world to my knees, then it could bring anybody to the knees. And I thought to myself, if I can show the world that you can come back from it and to get back in shape and get back to the top, then anybody can do it. I've experienced the highest highs and the lowest lows in life. Let's talk about one of the highest highs, what was supposed to be the highest, when you shocked the boxing world, upsetting yes. Vladimir Klitschko November 2015 to become the man who beat the man, lineal That's heavyweight correct. champion. You were on top of the world, right? Growing up, uh, that was my lifetime ambition, to beat Vladimir Klitschko, to be heavyweight champion of the world. You know, I went over to Germany, and I didn't feel like I was doing a great thing. Didn't, something had worked for me whole life, and when I finally achieved it, it was like, oh, well, that was a lot of rubbish. But I wasn't expecting now to feel like this. And like I said to you before, I just felt like a, an emptiness, a, a deep, gaping hole of nothing. Darkness and grey clouds. Every day was grey. Every day I woke up after that fight, even before the fight, for a long time would be grey days. And I felt like I had nothing to look forward to. I was worthless. I, I, I just... It was just a horrible, horrible feeling that people need to understand that many, many people are in the same boat. They don't have to be very successful sports athletes to feel like this. Anybody from day to day has the same feelings. And I believe that if enough people talk about it, then it's going to raise more and more and more awareness. And sooner or later, this crisis will have to be addressed properly. When was the first time you knew something was wrong with you, mentally speaking. I knew something was wrong with me my whole life. Growing up as a child, I'd, I'd feel a, a, a loneliness, even when I was with other people. I felt like, have you ever felt, have you ever been left behind somewhere when everyone else is going somewhere and you're left? That's how I'd feel on a regular basis, and I didn't know what it was. I didn't understand it. What was life like for you growing up? Life was, um, I just had a pretty regular uh, growing up, you know. Um, I wasn't a confident character what you see today. I was a very shy, reserved, skinny little whippet kid. And I had no confidence and I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew I was going to be heavyweight champion from the day I could ever think of anything but boxing. And that was my ultimate goal. I knew that was never going to be moved, but I didn't know I was going to get there. But yeah, growing up, I had no confidence. I wasn't given any confidence. I was always told that I couldn't do stuff and, and I'd never do anything. I'd never achieve anything. So that made me worse, basically. Um, I suppose when you get a bit older, you grow up and you meet more people, you experience different things. And then I went down the path of becoming a boxer. And as we mentioned, you became the champion of the world yeah. in November 2015, but things quickly spiraled out of control. What happened? Even before the fight, like a few days before the fight, I said to me dad, I said to me brothers, I said to everybody, I said, win, lose or draw this fight. I said, I'll probably never box again. I said, because it means nothing to me. Something I'd worked all my life for, fought so many hard fights to get. I was on the bridge of, verge of greatness, and it didn't mean nothing. So I was thinking, I've worked so hard to get this, and I don't appreciate where I am, it doesn't mean nothing to me. If I if fought, fought, I fought, if I didn't, I didn't win, lose, or draw, I wasn't bothered anyway. I mean, I'm saying, what are you on about? You've worked your whole life for this, you've sacrificed from being a child to 27 years old, what are you talking about? I said, I'm telling you the truth. It goes into the fight, wins the fight, like I always said I would. After the fight in the press conference, I was totally depressed. Someone asked me, 
uh, one of my strong listening guys is here actually, Christian. He said, what are you going to do after the fight? I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to be deeply depressed for a long time. Why did you say that? Because I knew it was coming. I couldn't stop it and I was on the verge of dropping off the other side. Every high, there's got to be a, an even high, a lower low. Mm. I believe every achievement that I do in life has got to be a, an almost certainty lower low. So the bigger the achievements, the lower the lulls go for me. So where did these feelings then lead to? What, what happened? Well, after the fight, I tried to, to block it out. I tried to put it in the back of my mind. I tried to carry on training and, and go on holiday with the family and all that. But eventually got the better of me. And I had a feeling that I didn't want to wake up anymore. I didn't want to live. I'd say to me, dad, my brothers, I wish I was dead 24 hours a day. Just constantly wishing bad things on myself and what, one, like not wanting to live. And I didn't value my family, my friends, achievements, money, fame, glory. Nothing meant nothing. And it was like, what is, what is the point of living? What, what am I living for? All right, I've won a belt. What does it mean? And then, then another fight with Klitschko got rearranged. And I think it's very plain for everybody to see if they watched the, the press conference before the second fight. They was like, oh, what's it, what's it mean to be heavyweight champion of the world? I said, it means nothing. I said, heavyweight champion of the world is worthless. And people can say I was very unwell at the time. And I look back at it now, when I look at these videos, and I can see that man is very unwell. And they said to me, what, what will it mean then? I said, it doesn't mean nothing. I said, I don't care if he knocks me out around. I said, I'm not interested. The belts mean nothing. World championship means nothing. What does it all mean? What does being a world champion really mean? But what I was trying to say was, what does it all really mean when I'm not well on the inside? Exterior assets mean nothing if you can't control what's going on in the inside. And the thing about mental health is what's so special and different is that if a man's got a disease or, or a bad problem or he's handicapped or disabled, you can see it. Yes. But I can walk down the street, nobody can see in my mind. They don't know what I'm doing. I could be on the verge of suicide and you couldn't tell because you can't see in someone's mind. So what did your family and your loved ones, what did they do with the way that you were acting? They went nuts. They didn't, they'd never seen anything like it before. I was in a position of power. I had glory, fame, achievements, money, a family, all earthly assets that one could want, money in the bank, but it meant nothing. So they couldn't understand why would this man feel like this. Everybody looking on the outside, oh, Tyson's got everything, he's done everything, he's done what he ever said he wanted to do. He's lived his dream, he's done everything. Why is it he's just an idiot and he's a attention seeker? What, what steps did you take to alleviate these I, tr I tried and tried and tried to act sensible and blank it out, but it didn't work. So until the end of the all right, forget about it. I can't box anymore, I'm finished. I'm going to go drinking. That... Because when I had a drink, it, it made the pain go away. Not pain as in physical pain, like punching me in the face pain, but pain as longing and the repetitive thinking, the same stuff day in, day out, and it won't go away. And the more I'm trying to think, right, I want to be positive, negative, 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 negative. And everyone I was around was getting negative too because I was putting it on them. So the alcohol masked the pain. It the gave you what you thought were moments of... Peace. Of peace, and I can bear when it's done. It does max the, it masks the pain while you're doing it. But when you wake up the next day, you're even more depressed than you started. Because whatever is in the alcohol puts you in a bad state afterwards. Like I say, every, every good high, there's got to be a good low. And whatever you do in life like that, if you suffer with mental health, you'll, you'll know where I'm coming from. And I just spiralled out of control. I didn't care. I didn't want to live. I'd lost the passion to live. So nothing meant anything. A boxing career, well, that was the last thing on my mind. What was rock bottom for you? Do you know, I just didn't care anymore. I didn't care what happened. Even when, the, when, I, when the, the, the promoters made me vacate all the belts, I didn't care. It was like, oh, you've worked all your life for this. He not bothered me, wife, I'd say. I'd say, no, I don't care if I had nothing. I don't care if I was dead. I don't care if I was living in the streets. So when was, can you specify a moment where you knew, okay, this is something now this much bigger on, than myself? This one on for 18 months. Wow. Of me battling my own self every day, drinking, abusing my body, eating rubbish, taking and drugs. That must have taken its toll on you. You're a married father. A married you father. family and loved ones to support. Yeah. You, you saw the toll it was taking on them? Of course. It's not, it's not good to be in a relationship with someone who, who's give up on life. Was so, there ever an ultimatum given to you by family members or your wife even that may have spearheaded change? There was, no, there wasn't no ultimatums like that, but 
I'd go out early in the day and I won't come back till then. Well, I might, might go for three or four days. There was no, I ain't going out for a few beers and coming home. I was going out to try and kill myself with drink. And the drink led to other drugs, right? Drugs and whatever. And look, nothing mattered to me anymore. Everything that I, I cared dearly about and all my morals. I'd never took a drug in my life ever. You had never done drugs before the Klitschko fight? No. Nothing. Not a single thing in my life. You I, drank? I drank, but not, not a regular drink of maybe two, three times a year, man. That'd be it. But so now, all of a sudden, now, your behavior every, everything had to. Everything that I hated, I did. Yeah. Everything I stood for didn't matter anymore. Because I was going to die anyway, and I was trying to make, I was trying to kill myself. So when did it reach the critical point where you may have died? The critical point was I was driving home one day and I had a very massive anxiety attack, one of the worst feelings I've ever felt in my life. I felt I was dying. I was having a heart attack. I couldn't breathe properly. I felt like everybody was against me. I felt like all my friends had set me up, even my wife. I felt she was involved in it. So physical and mental and spiritual. Can you describe a little bit more? Because I think this is important. We always struggle, and I know it's a struggle, to articulate yeah. what others can't see. I often refer to it, and it's, it's ironic that you are the heavyweight champion of the world. I make a living as a combat sports announcer. A constant fight in my mind, whether it's the god and devil, whatever you want to. And so for me, it, 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 similar to yourself, it came out through my harsh words to, to loved ones, through the way I treated myself. So for you, when you were having that panic attack, what were the, what were the physical symptoms? The physical symptoms of the panic attack? I felt like I was having a heart attack, like I said before. I didn't know what was happening. I felt pains in my chest. I was neon going blind. Um, I was calling out to God to forgive me for my sins. I, no one could be more certain of death than me that day. I ain't afraid of nothing or no man. I don't care about anybody. I didn't care about dying. I didn't care about nothing. Nothing mattered to me. I'm not bothered about nothing. I ain't afraid of nothing or nobody. If a man come here with a gun today and say, shoot me, you got any bollocks, do it. That's the type of person I am. On this day, I was afraid of a child. I was so frightened of dying. And I don't fear death. I embrace it. But I was so afraid. It was like, it was my worstest nightmares times a thousand. Everything that I was afraid of in my life that I tried to man up with hit me all at once. Bam, 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 bam. Mm. I was, I was frightened. I was a, like a vulnerable child. I was fricked to death. I didn't know what to do. All I could see was me kids having no father, growing up, and, oh, your father's a letdown. He's let you all down. He's a worthless piece of rubbish. He took the easy way out. All this, he brought it on himself. He wasn't a good father. He wasn't a good man. He was a useless, worthless piece of rubbish. All this was going through my mind at this time, and I'm, I'm trying to battle against it, saying, no. I'm the heavyweight champion of the world. I'm having a fight in my own mind. One voice is telling me I'm a worthless dosser. The next, I'm saying I'm not. I'm the heavyweight champion of the world. Shadow boxing while I'm on my do death door. Mm. So it's like I've got two angels in my mind, an angel and a demon. One, one telling me I'm good, one telling me I'm bad. Anyway, I got rushed to hospital. I went straight to the hospital. The doctor said, calm down, you're going to have an heart attack. I accused everybody in the hospital of being against me. Um, it was unexplainable what I was feeling. I'd never, ever experienced anything in my whole life, even though I'd had anxiety before. This was the king daddy of all anxiety attacks. This was, I was so sure I was going to die, but nothing mattered. I didn't care. All I wanted was, was atonement for my sins. Got to the hospital, I didn't die. I'm in this dying streak for about an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes anyway. They give me some pills, calm me down. I had my dad drive through, my brothers and all my family, hours in the car to Lancaster, where I live. I was adamant that I'd, um, I'd been drugged or something could happen to me and all the doctors were covering it up. This is, I was totally gone. I, I, soon after this, I believed I was going to end up in a padded room, walking around in circles. This is how bad it got for me. I can't tell you in words how I felt, how down I was. When you lose control of your own mind, you're in a bad place. Know. You know, I didn't even, like, today, I look back on it and I, and I know what I was going through. What were you going through?
I was going through hell. I was being tortured by demons and devils on a daily basis. This is what I believe. I believe that God tested me. God gave me the world. But I rebelled against it and it didn't mean nothing to me. I didn't want it when I had it. So he thought, right, I'll give you a little bit of pain here. Taste this, wallop. And I believe that that's what mental health is. I believe it is a, it could be a test. It could not be. I know it affects so many people in so many different ways. Sure. And it's a silent killer. It's almost like carbon monoxide poisoning. You can't smell it, you can't taste it, you can't feel it, but you die. So many people take their lives on a daily basis through mental health problems. And others look at them and say, he was a weak person or she was a weak person. We're not weak, no. you just need help. And sometimes you don't know where to go and who to speak to for that help. Yeah, you're showing your continued strength by, by talking to us today. How? Um, what, I'll just what get back you... onto my story. Yeah, were you diagnosed? Then that night? No, he gave me some pills. and it, uh, I think it was like a relaxing pills. And I didn't take them. I'm anti-pill. I, I said, no. I said, I'm not going to take no pills. I'm going to get through this on my own. And I'd heard loads of um, rubbish about these pills and I'd done research and whatever. It was, I didn't feel like I wanted to go down that road. Side effects made My you feel grandfather worse. was on a placebo pills his whole life. Wow. They didn't do anything. They were like Smarties. But without him, he couldn't function. He had to have his pills every day, four times a day. And if my granny didn't get his pills quick enough, they would be murders in that house. He'd smash things up. And really, they were, there was nothing in the pills. The doctor, the doctor told me, granny, they were, they were fake pills. But he thought they were pills for his mind. Hmm. So it's his hereditary, and it comes from my father's side. Um, there's a lot of people in my father's side all suffer with mental health problems. But they never dealt with it, right? Well, they didn't know how to deal with it. It was like years ago, like 100 yeah. years ago, 50 years ago, whatever, get, get on with it. And even to today, I, I, I hear people saying, oh, he's, he's a moaner, him. He's a, of course. He's got everything and he's still upset. He's never appreciative. What do you he, say to those like, people who still perpetuate He's looking for stigma. attention. Yeah. So what, what do you say to those people? I'm not looking for attention. If I want attention, I do my job. It's the most attention-seeking job in the world. Yeah. I don't care about attention or fame. I just want to spread the word of, of mental health and get people who are suffering to, to get better. You know, I've, I've almost come an unofficial, official sporting mental health ambassador. Oh, I... I, I get so many messages on social media and, and things and people coming over to me, finding me in the middle of nowhere, saying, I need to talk to you for five minutes or, or professional sports athletes, footballers, rugby players, hockey players, everything asking me questions, how do you deal with this, how do you deal with that, and I'm trying to answer them the best way I can. I'm thinking, this is my purpose in life. I thought it was to be heavyweight champion of the world and, and do what I had to do, but I now know my, my calling card is to spread the word on mental health, and whatever it takes to do it, I'm doing it. I, I applaud you because I... was I only in agree. Belfast recently at a fight, my last fight against Pianetta. This guy come in, like, he looked like a businessman with a suit on, he was smartly dressed, hair combed, he had a big black eye. He came over to me and he said, which one of you is Tyson Fury? So we thought the man was like wanting pictures or to sign something. So we said, oh, that's in me dad. <laughs> so he said, oh, are you Tyson? He said, yeah. He said, do you think you could kill a man with one punch? This is what he said to me. He thought it was wow. me, yeah? yeah? And my dad said, um, he said, that's going overboard. He said, that's not really right. He said, that's Tyson. He said, he said I've, I've come here. He said, I've drove hours to speak to you. He said, I need to speak to you personally, I say he's alone. But this fellow was acting very strange. So my family and friends and people around me thought he was gonna pull a knife out and shoot me or stab me or whatever. He was, he was acting very weird. But I could tell he wasn't well. So I said, come on, me and you around here. And everyone followed me, I said, no, leave, leave us on our own. I didn't know this fellow from Adam, by the way. He said, I need to speak to you, Tyson. He said, I had everything. He said, I was diagnosed with cancer. He said, and I was, he said, I was, I was a big businessman. He said, I had everything. He said, and I, I've, I went off the rails, he said, and I can't get back. He said, I've, I've attempted suicide on, on loads of occasions. He said, I haven't got the, the minerals to do it, he said. I can't do it. He said, I've, I've even, he said, how'd you get, I said, how'd you get the black eye? He said, well, I went into a pub, he said, to some violent characters and was very cheeky, hoping they'd kill me. Wow. But they just gave me a punch and sent me going. So I told him, I said, what you need to do, mate, I said, is, is seek medical advice immediately. Yes. I said, bottling this up, I said, it's not going to help you or me or your family. I said, have you got family? He said, I've got a wife and kids. He said, but during me down, me mental health problem times, he said, in depression, he said, I've, I've, I've destroyed me marriage. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I've been sleeping with ladies of the night. Mm -hmm. He said, my wife knows about it. 
I said, right. I said, but everyone, I said, in, in moments of time like this, I said, everyone can deserve a second chance. I said, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to tell that you're on well. I said, and you're not yourself. I said, are you acting like yourself? He said, no. He said, I couldn't be further from myself ever than I am now. I said, you need to go to the hospital. I said, and speak to somebody. Or I said, at least speak to some, some friends or family about it. He said, I can't speak to nobody because nobody understands what I'm going through. And I, I can relate to him because... You understand. I understood. I said, I understand every word. I said, I feel your pain. He said, being here and speaking to you for 15 minutes, he said, I feel like my heart rate's gone down and I feel relaxed. I said, it will do. I said, because you're talking to somebody who's experienced it and knows, I said, you need to get some counselling. I said, you need to speak to professional people. I said, if you bottle this up, I said, the way I explain mental health is you bottle up and bottle up and bottle up and then it just explodes. You can't, you can't bottle anymore. And that's, that's when you're having your, your bad times. Do you think your anxiety attack, your panic attack was it's your my way explosion. Of explosion? 100 million percent. What, what, what happened immediately? I mean, we know what happened to your career, but what, was, what has life been like after that moment where you were told by the doctor what was a diagnosis of bipolar disorder? Yeah. Um, and probably other things you've talked about. Yeah, depression and anxiety. I mean, give me some pills, I didn't take them. I thought, I'm not going to take these pills. I don't want them. Um, about a month later, I thought I was all right. It took me ages to get over this. It was like... What did you do to become all right over that month? Well, I was just trying to relax and not think about too much and just, just take time off and away from everything. And that's when I vacated everything because I didn't have... I couldn't, I couldn't focus on defending that. And I was holding the world of division boxing up. I couldn't be the person holding everything up. So I said, right, get rid of everything. I need some time. I need some time alone and get bigger, better. And um, I went away on holiday with the, with the wife and kids. I thought I was perfect. I thought I was back normal again. And I got to the hotel and I didn't sleep for three days. I was waking, I was in the night like this, closing my fists, clenching, grinding my teeth. I was, I was looking out the curtains. I was waiting for someone to come in to me. I am thinking, right, when someone comes in that door, you're going to get it. I've, I've definitely thought people were trying to attack me. So I said, Paris, says, I'd book us home now. I said, I booked, I booked for two weeks. We left after four days. And every day I was there, I was battling, like, I need to just stay one more day, one more day. I said, get me home now. I said, I can't take it. He said, give me them pills out of your handbag. Yeah. After three days, yeah, yeah she brought the pills with her. I said, wallop, wallop, wallop. Lovely nights. I was, I was praying. I said, please, God, I said, let me go to sleep now. I said, please, I said, I can't, I've not gone to sleep. I said, take this away from me now. I was praying, I was crying. Tears were rolling down my face. And I said to Paris, I said, give me them pills out. And I took the pills and I, it was like drinking. It was the same effect as the drink. I didn't care about anything again. Apathy. Yeah, it was like, oh, well, I feel better now. Thank you. And I, um, <clears throat> I said, right, we've got to go home because I, I need to seek medical advice properly. Good for you. I didn't take it serious the first time. I got home and I didn't to seek any advice again. I kept on doing what I was doing and what thought doing? it was going to go away drinking. We, were, we went away again after a while and it took me ages. And I said, like, do you know what I got in the habit of doing? Drinking four or five drinks every night because... And that had helped me go straight to sleep, no problem. Did anyone in your support network, your wife, your, your f dad, your brothers, anyone try to stop you or was it? Everybody. Nobody could stop me because they couldn't, they couldn't feel what I was feeling. It's all right talking to me and telling me though this and the other. But the only way I thought I, I'm, I can handle this was I had a massive fridge in my garage, a big like triple decker fridge. And I filled it with beers mm -hmm. and every night, Without fail, I'd go and have three or four beers. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what? This isn't a bad life, this. This is great. <laughs> Foot the sports on, wallop. Beers, happy days. Do you want a beer? Yep, perfect. And I was drinking every day, something I'd never done in my life. Wow. To try and wash me uh, sorrows away. But it didn't, it come to a stage where I thought, oh, well, that's one way of doing it, but I'm going heavier and heavier. I was gaining 380, 390, 400 pounds, and I was very unhealthy. I didn't fit in anything I owned anymore. It wasn't me anymore. I had, I had two bodies. I had to get all new clothes. I was walking around in, in like fat man clothes. I was a state. I was a mess. And I couldn't help it. 
I was busting out of like 7XL clothing. And at one, the turning point for me was, yeah. was that it was Halloween last year. And I'd never suffered any more anxiety attacks or anything since about mid to late summer that year, like 17. Mm -hmm. But I was still drinking and still going out partying and whatever, and I didn't value nothing at all. But every time I got drunk, I'd come home and I'd say, right, I'm starting training in the morning, regain mission. I'm going to be the heavyweight champion of the world again. You watch. You were 400 pounds. 400 pounds. I was the man who called Wolf a thousand times. Phone all my friends up, phone chain up, get them all going, come on. We're going to do it Monday. Monday had come, no, I do not want a box anymore. Finished. Turning point was, I went out Halloween dressed as a uh, skeleton in a fancy dress party. I went out about nine o'clock and I expected to stay out all night and get smashed. I had one drink. I looked around me and I thought, what am I doing? That was the first time you had that thought of yeah. what is going on here? I'm, I'm back normal again now, yeah? I'm back like thinking straight. Still drinking, but I'm thinking sensible again. I said to myself, you're telling me that you'd rather be here with a load of kids half your age? Because I feel like the old person now when I go out, I'm 30. Yeah. They're all 18 old. and, like, I know it's 21 over here, but over home it's sure. 18. They're all like 18, 19, 20, 21. And I'm there, I'm like the old guy in the disco bopping around. Is this what you really want when you've got a family at home and you're depriving your kids and your wife of, of quality time? Wow. Yeah, I pushed everything I held dear away from me. I thought, is this it? You traded having all them achievements for what? And I knew I couldn't do it on my own. I just knew it. I couldn't do it. I'd said so many times I was going to do it and believed I was going to do it in the night. But the next day come, I didn't have no motivation to do it. That's another thing that mental health will give you. No, zero motivation to do anything. Zero motivation to have a shave, zero to brush your teeth, even have a shower, nothing. I got back that night and my wife thought I was drunk. I, I come home early. She says, oh, you're home early. I said, yeah, I said, I've had enough of this life. I said, she, I, she said that or you said it? She said, you're home early, yeah? Yep. And I said, I've had enough of this oh, good. life. Yep. She here he goes again, he's talking rubbish. She wants to kill himself again, does he? I said, no. I said, this, oh, I've jumped the gun, actually. I come back, I went upstairs to my room. I got down, I took the skeleton suit off and I got down on my knees. And I was in a dark room on my own. And I was praying to God to help me. I was begging, there was tears rolling down my face because I knew I couldn't do it alone. And I said, look, I said, I know, I know I've been tested, I know I've done so many things wrong and I've, I've done this and I've done that and I've, I'm so weak as I can't do it on my own. I said, please intervene here and show me the way. Show me the light. I said, because I'm sick of living in darkness. I was down there praying at least 10 minutes. And I'm an emotional wreck. Me, me, me shirt's wet all, I feel all my chest all wet. Crying my eyes out like a baby. And I got up off my knees and I felt a weight lifted off my shoulders. And I called out to my wife, I said, Paris, here. She said, what? I said, tomorrow. I said, I start to turn my life around. And this was Halloween night of yeah. 2017. She said, yeah, yeah, I've heard it all before. Because I'm the man who cried wolf a thousand times. I said, I promise you. I said, I'm going to do it. I'm definitely going to do it. And um, nobody believed me. But I knew I had a smile on my face, twinkle in my eye, and I knew I had to get that weight off. By the way, at this time, I was looking at a 12-year ban. I'd failed two drugs tests for cocaine because all the time I was out, I was still doing random drugs tests. So I had cocaine in my system on two times, occasions. The British Boxing Border Control had suspended my licence. I was deemed medically unfit to fight by the leading psychiatrist in the country. And I had millions of pounds, millions of dollars in, in um, 
lawyers' fees to pay on ongoing battle in court cases. But I am so confident that I'm going to come back and everything's going to be swept away. The odds of me overcoming all them obstacles, never mind the weight and the yeah. mental health, is like zero. He, it's not possible. He ain't coming back because he can't. From that day, I got my tracksuit on in the morning and I was going to run two mile. I got about 200 yards and stopped. And I thought, right, I can't, I can't run. I've run all my life. I've always been a very good runner. And I got 200 yards and I was totally gone. I could feel my belly moving on the... It wasn't like a fat like jelly. It was like solid brick. It was a, it was a horrible feeling. I thought, okay, I'm going to walk the rest. And I walked. Wow. And while I was walking, I was on my phone and I saw a little video from Deontay Wilder. And he said, ha, Tyson Fury let himself down, let his family down. He said, he's that fat, he'd never come back. He said, and I'm glad he's gone because I'd have knocked him out anyway. Just rambling on nonsense here. Yeah. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to give it you proper. You're my motivation now. Wow. I'm coming back to get you. And, and every day I'd go out on the canal and I'd do a little run in my sweatsuit. And every day I'd get a little bit further until I was doing four or five mile again. Consistently, every day. Every single never day. Never, back, never, never said back. Never said, no, today. that's enough no. for today. No. Even in the rain, I was out with me, with me Mac on running. Why do you think you were able to do that? Like I say, I had a fulfillment. The mo motivation was the there? The motivation was back. When I was on my knees, I was in an emotional wreck state. When I got up, I felt everything was lifted. So you started by walking and jogging? God says, give me your heavy burdens and I will make your, your work light. And I was trying to do it on my own before. I wasn't doing the way that God wanted me to do, like give all my problems to him. This time I did. So I wasn't battling on my own. I had the, the, the biggest power the universe has got on my side. And I was running and I got on the phone to Ben. And there was a lot of stuff going on with me, me old trainer Peter and all that. Was, ben Davison, your current yeah. trainer? I was stale in the gym, like, in so many training camps. I said, I need to change. I said, I'm going to come back to boxing. Everyone's saying, you're not going anywhere. You're getting banned anyway. You're out. You're out. You can go nowhere. So forget about trainers. I said, I'm coming back. I said, I'm going to win the heavyweight championship of the world again. I said, whether you believe it or not, I said, I'm telling you, I'm going to do it. So anyway, I said, I want a new team. I had a new promoter and I had a new trainer. This time it was December now. I goes into this, this court case and they, everyone said, it's a political court case against you. You're getting your hat nailed on today. You're getting a 12-year ban. I said, really? I said, are you that confident? Yeah. I said, I'm telling you, I'm going to walk out of that courtroom. I said, and I'm not going to get no ban. Nothing. OK, we'll see. Their lawyers had spent well over 1.5 million trying to nail me hat on. Goes in. And we, we called it quits on both sides to never have enough evidence to, to charge me. So he said, right, if you pay your lawyer's fees, because I was suing them. I said, if this goes wrong for you today, I'm suing you for $50 million. Mm -hmm. I said, you've destroyed my life and career. And by the way, yeah, I was being accused of taking drugs, even though I never took a drug in my life. This was another thing. This was all to add to the flavour of the mental health problems. That was driving me insane. You don't think that, and I'm playing devil's advocate yeah. here now, that in a moment of weakness or where you don't remember that you may have done that kind of stuff. Like, you're not using what you were suffering through as an excuse. No, it wasn't a recreational drug. Right. Yeah, I, I thought I mean the nandrolone, the yeah, performance-enhancing drug. they said I took a performance-enhancing drug. drug on a mild level, which, let me explain, go into the case. In England, if you go out and have, have one beer, two pints are allowed, and then jump in a car and drive, you're OK. You've got alcohol in your system. If you, if you get pulled over and do a breathalyzer test, yep, you've been drinking, but you're not over the limit. So, no problem, carry on. I had nandrolone in my system because everybody in the world has nandrolone in their system. It's a natural producing drug. It come, it's, it's produced in the body. Someone at 10 stone, someone at 100 pounds is going to have less nandrolone than someone at 250 pounds who's on a high-protein diet and eating everything. So, they had nothing. They never had a thing, and, and at that time, they never had enough had evidence to charge, and it was supposed to be, forget about it, it wasn't happening, because we can't charge you because it's not enough evidence. And if it was enough evidence, they'd have went wallop, 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 get rid of him for sure, he's, an, he's, a, he's, a, he's a nightmare, get rid of him. But they couldn't, 
So I walked out of that case scot-free. Took them nearly two and a half years to make the decision whether I was guilty or not guilty. How much did that add to your motivation? And I walked out and I said, thank you, God. I said, no. I said, people will listen today. So then that was one, one obstacle fell over. That was gone, totally gone. But I did have a, a $1.2 million lawyer's fee because it costs a lot of money to hear these cases and whatever. I thought, okay, the money's one thing. Let's get on with it. I can earn money when I come back boxing. I'm still 400 pounds. I was this going time. to say that's incredible <laughs> to, to look at you now. I, yeah. How did you lose all that weight? I'm going to tell you what happened. The, the quickly story. And then I went to the boxing border control and I said, right, I want my license back. I'm going to make a comeback. They said, right, you need to pass the same person who made you medically unfit. You've got to go and get medically fit. And if the, that doctor makes you medically fit, mentally and physically then we haven't got a problem with it. I said, fine. So I went and saw all the psychiatrists and everybody I'd saw, Dr. Phil, Dr. Martin, all these people, they said, excellent, perfect. He said, no problem, stamp, bang, bang, bang. Every one of them deemed me medically well and everything was back to normal. I just had 400 pound to shift. Mm -hmm. Goes, I said, there you go, bang, reissue me license. Thank you very much. They had a, a board meeting, a, a high board meeting. And they said, right, approved, but bang, reinstated me license couldn't believe it and um, everything that I had obstacle against me was now gone I was on a clear running path only had to lose some weight now weight um, to me <laughs> is nothing because I've always ballooned up I always put 100 pounds on after fights every single time I've never been so heavy never been at that weight but I've been at 380 before 385 many many times so okay I phoned Ben up Ben Coleman we started training together and everyone laughed and sniggered when I picked Ben as my coach because he's a young guy, never had no experience, nothing. They said, he's gone from one extreme to the next. I had a new promoter, new team, new people around me. None of, none of the old me exists anymore. It's all gone. This is the new me now. And then I come back and I worked my way back and we worked repetitively, day in, day out, day in, day out. And at that time, I was still sleeping with the light on. I couldn't sleep in the dark. Because I I, if, I if I can't see in the dark, I don't know what's in the room. At the first training camp back, I was still sleeping with my light on in the room. But I thought, no, nope, I'm perfect. I'm great. And what I love to do was fight. Every, all the time I'm in the gym, perfect, no problems. And um, I'd had that first fight, lovely. It was, it was, I felt like a fish back in the ocean. And I've never looked back since. I've never had no more mental health problems since, praise the Lord. And I... Um, how have you managed it then? Is it through because exercise, we now know, I, I, plays I, a big factor? Yeah, 100%. Exercise plays a big factor in it. Diet? Diet. What do you eat, if you don't yourself, mind me asking? Giving yourself goals. Yes. Yeah, please continue. And I have this, this effect. It's called the whoop whoop effect. The which? Whoop whoop effect. Whoop whoop, okay. So every time you feel a little bit sad, or you're starting to feel like you're going to go down, and you start to feel like you're going to dip from your normal level playing ground. You've got to say this. You've got to say whoop, whoop three times very loud. Yeah? And then if you ain't smiling after that... <laughs> I'm smiling already. There you go. Nothing it. is going to make you smile. Do you I use meditation? fact it works. Really? I'm going to try it. How about meditation? Meditation, I pray. I'm, that's I'm, your meditation. I wouldn't say I'm religious, because mm. that's not what I'm about. Mm. But I believe in God and I believe... With God, anything is possible. Without God, nothing is achievable. Pete Davidson of Saturday Night Live recently said on an episode in regards to Kanye West, being mentally ill doesn't give you the right to be, you know, a jackass. Uh, yeah. I don't try, I'm not defined by my bipolar disorder diagnosis, nor are you. And yet, we've, I, I've done things I'm ashamed of. Yeah. Can't necessarily blame the illness. In terms of everything you've been through, and I, I saw the reaction at first when, when you were, you know, in the worst place of your life and how social media can really pile on and, and others who don't understand. Anything, not necessarily regret, but is there something you would like to talk about as a teaching tool that you know, people can understand about what you were like and why? Yeah. When you're in that frame of mind, you're not yourself. It's not you. You're somebody else who I don't recognise. Shane's known me my whole life, but he didn't know me at that point. My dad didn't know me. He said, I don't even know you anymore. He said, you're not the same person. Who are you? And I think, oh, well, you don't know me. I'm what? 
but that was that was the attitude I had. So you're not yourself. And if you if you if you get time later, go and watch that interview with me and Klitsch go around the round table for the second second fight. You can see it was very not myself. I'm back to normal now, and you know. You, what is normal so now? Lot, normal is is being thinking straight in, in a stable mental health, a stable lifestyle. You were talking about it earlier, and I, I kind of interrupted, which I want to do. I apologize. So if you were to tell people right now, and you're only one example, and just having this conversation I know is going to help, but yeah. people look to you, and I know you're a very popular fan base, and it's growing by legions, and yes, you have your critics. We all do. If you don't have any haters, then you're probably not doing something right, right, Ty uh, Tyson? But even Picasso had his critics, but we can't name them, can we? <laughs> <laughs> very well said. So if you were to tell your fans right now, what it is that you do to keep yourself normal, on as it were? On a straight playing field. Well, I believe there's a balance in life, and it's a straight line. Normal people are straight like that, and they might dip a little bit and come straight back up. People who suffer with mental health problems, their graph is like that. So how I, how I manage mine is I give myself goals. I need to train on a daily basis. If I don't train for two days, I feel totally depressed. So now, when you say train, is it just boxing training no, or no, just no. Exercise? exercising? Whether it's jogging, whether it's riding a bike, whether it's going for a walk, anything. You need to stimulate the mind. And I think training is a perfect way to do it, working out, exercising. Whether you can do a lot or a little, you must do something. Um, I give myself short-term goals and long-term goals. And I plan things more now. Where if, if I've just not got anything on the horizon, I, I tend to wander and my mind goes... Able, but when I've got something on planned and I've got things going and I want to do this, this and this, even if it's you don't, it doesn't have to be big things. It can be small, tiny goals. What means something to you as a person, as an individual, then that's what you need to do. That works for me, but what works for me might not work for the next person. But I'm very, very sure that working out and having a routine in your life is 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 the answer for mental health problems. How important is your support network? You talked about knowing that you were going to leave your kids without a father when you were at your darkest moments. For some of us, those are the reasons we choose not to even have a family, is because of that fear. H how does your, your family, your wife, your kids, your loved ones, how do they now help you? You know, having a family and having a supportive family, you know, it helps a lot. But. It's not just family. We, we, we don't choose our family, we, we choose our friends. And now, people, people may not have great friends, they may not have top friends, they may not have any friends. But you always need somebody to speak to, and I believe talking is the key to anything. If we've got a problem, we need to talk about it. Do you have a therapist? I don't see a therapist, no, but I we do have long conversations about the randomest things in the world in this camp. All these boys here are with me, we talk. Some people will call it nonsense talking, but I, 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 I see it as educational um, conversations because all the time you're thinking about things and you're talking and you're interacting with others, I believe if you are on your own a lot, then you've got time to think and you've got time to go over your problems and think about it and dwell on them. And, and it's not good. I don't think people who suffer with mental health should be alone all the time. I think they should have regular interaction with other other human beings, other people. What's next in terms of your, your mental health advocacy? It's obvious you are, like myself, dedicating your life to, to raising awareness, to smashing the stigma. What, what do you have planned? For me, I think I know I've got the skeleton key to mental health now for myself. I really have. Like I say, I've got the whoop whoop effect. That's one. And um, now with, a, with a, a routine in my life, I love training. Even when I'm not boxing, I love to go to the gym. When I don't go to the gym, I feel terrible. But when I train on a daily basis, I feel great. Now I know, if I train on a daily basis for the rest of my life, then I'll, I don't think I'm gonna suffer with mental health problems again. And if, I tell you what mental health things can bring on as well, like when things are going wrong for you in your life, when you, when you put your faith and trust in somebody and it goes wrong, well, life stressors. Your doctor asked you, were you undergoing stress? Yeah, life and that, stresses. The loss of my best friend at 19 is what triggered my first yeah. episode and how I was diagnosed. So it, it can be diet, it can be environment, it can be genetics. The more we educate ourselves, Tyson, the more the society educates, the less stigma there is. And really that's all we're looking for, right? Is love, compassion, empathy, the amount of attention we put on things as serious as cancer. 
HIV and AIDS and, and everything as equally debilitating mental health. As we said, it's, it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem because we continue to stigmatize it. We continue to shame people into suffering in silence, and that's killing them. And it's not just adults who suffer from mental oh, health. Half of all mental health illnesses begin at 14, my friend. There was a young girl, 14 or 15, she threw herself off a motorway bridge on the way, when I was on the way to the gym. And we were stuck in traffic, and someone told me, and I was like, I had to do a video straight away. That's fantastic. For I, you to do, it's yeah, I had, I had it's to. True. I had to do a video to say, look, for this that is another life lost family. because you can't talk about it. Some families, it's untalkable. My, my family being one of them. Oh, for so many. And, and it continues. And that's why, though, I think you here during a training camp for the biggest fight of your life, challenging Deontay Wilder December 1st, uh, two undefeated champions at Staples Center at Showtime Championship Boxing Pay-Per-View. Here I'm going into hype mode, but the reason I bring it is because you talk about goals. Your short term and your long term, you have your target set for December 1st. I'm going to tell you something else. I've already won. Because whether I, I win, agree. win the fight or not on December the 1st, I'm a winner. Oh, I because, think it's one of the greatest comebacks. Because I've period. come back from every possible disadvantage to being healthy. I'm studying now 255 pounds in shape in a mentally great place. And I, I feel so great. I've got a few marks on me, but I love it. I'm in the ring spar and I'm struggling in the ring because it's so much not air, but I'm, I'm so happy that I'm in there and I'm like, I'm back doing what I love to do. And if I can help others along the way too, I know I've done a good job. And I'm not gonna stop inspiring people forever because I know I've been through the worstest, worstest pain that anyone can ever feel mentally as well as physically. I, I joked it. that you didn't just kiss the Blarney Stone, you are the Blarney Stone. And I want you one more time now just to sum it all up. Why are you a mental health advocate? What do you want those suffering to, to know? And, and what, what is the future like for Tyson Fury as a mental health advocate? Well, I think I've now found my calling card. Boxing's one thing in a career, but all careers end. All, all sporting careers, everything else has to come to an end sooner or later. It doesn't last forever. Along the way, I'm going to spread the word of mental health throughout the world. Millions of people watch heavyweight champion of the world. Maybe that's why I'm in this position as the heavyweight champion of the world to spread this. I'm qualified to talk about it because I've been through it. Some people who talk about mental health and doctors and things, they've never ever suffered mental health. They've read about it in a book. But reading about something in a book and, and physical experience are what, two different things. I can tell you that. You could read about boxing in a book yeah. then get in there and try and do it. Yeah. Doesn't work. No. You could read about doing a brain surgery in a book. There's many books out there that talk about brain surgeries. But that doesn't qualify you to then go and do it. So I believe I'm very qualified in that matter because I've been through it. And what I intend to do is keep helping people on a regular basis, whoever and whoever I can. And I don't know where this path's going to lead, but one thing I do know is I'm going to follow it to the end. Well, I know... And for all those people out there who are suffering, I want you to know that every day for two years was very grey and dark for me. But it will come back great again. You will have sunshine days again. Rose-coloured days warm by the sun. Well, I know that the moment the bell goes to begin round one on December 1st at the Staples Center in Los Angeles, you will have already authored one of the greatest comebacks in sports history. I uh, thank you for this so thank very you so much. much. Most important interview I will ever conduct together. We will continue to smash stigma. He is the undefeated lineal heavyweight champion, Tyson Fury, who has opened up about his battles with mental health. And the more we talk about mental health, the more we will continue to smash the stigma. Keep fighting the good fight.